to Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about uh, a variety of books with a Marxist and anarchist perspective. And uh, I'm joined by my ho- co-host, Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me, Justin. Thanks for having me, Corey. It's always good to see you. Um, we're we're in the the we're in the the glory high, high days of summer. It's already been very very hot here in the U.S. Oh, is that right? Um, it's pretty hot in Indiana. Yesterday it was in the basically you know low nineties and oh, degrees geez. Fahrenheit, so it was pretty 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 warm. Today wow. is not so bad because it rained, um, but uh, we're we're definitely hitting a heat wave here in the U.S. Um, wow. Some parts of Texas are horrific. Um, they've been putting out some maps about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's pretty scary. So people are making sure they stay hydrated. Um, we mowed the lawn last week, so we don't have to do it now in this next couple of weeks. Cause it's going to be super, super hot. But, uh, yeah, we, uh, we have, I haven't had the air conditioner on, I think three days yet. Nice. <laughs> it's, it's been like so miserable, cold, raining the whole time like, <laughs> since mid early May it's been raining. So hey, man, I'll take that. I mean, the situation this year at this time is much better than the situation was last year at this right. time with the wildfires where I, most of my summer, there was this a haze over my, over where I lived. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, so I'm grateful that that's not a thing, yep. uh, at least yet, hopefully knock on wood, hopefully. whatever. Yeah, but uh, yeah, you, your fingers <laughs> crossed all that jazz, right? Yeah. Um, nothing that actually does anything but makes you feel good. <laughs> yeah, um, right. But uh, but yeah, um, so yeah, no, it's been it's been a. I think it's going to be a very hot summer. Um, pretty much the thing is in the years that I've because I've lived in Indiana my whole life, so like I you know I've I've noticed the change in weather even in my own lifetime, or at least it right. feels like that. Where basically I feel like everything shifts it's like summer shifts a little longer winter shifts a little shorter we don't really have as many snowstorms now in indiana as we used to like usually have one big snow event in the winter time and that's it Uh like there might be flurries here and there but generally we have one big snow event and that's it um and uh and yeah that's how it's been the last few years um, but you know, that, that's all very subject to change, but like sometimes it gets bitter cold. Uh, and then sometimes it's like crazy, crazy hot. Um, right. and it stays pretty warm in Indiana from basically like May until October. Like it's pretty warm for most of that time. It's really only until October, maybe mid to late October into November that it actually okay. starts getting chilly. Um, uh, but, we, sh- yeah. we should have started getting hot weather more here by now, but yeah, usually it doesn't start till probably June ish. Like it last year, it was really hot right in May, so like it's quite a bit more mild this year. But we'll see how it goes, I guess. Well, that's nice. That's a plus. I mean, you know, take the cake, the good stuff when you can. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So tonight we are, you know, we've been kind of deep in talking about history. We've kind of talked a little bit about the history of. Soviet Union. We've talked about the history of the nuclear bomb. We've talked about Vietnam. We've talked about all this stuff in the past. Yeah. Today, we're going to be kind of talking about the present, where we are now and what things are going on now and what may come to us more, unfortunately, in the future. And this was a book that was definitely requested by folks um, and one that I know I've been wanting to read for a while. Um, and so our book tonight is um, Techno Feudalism. What Killed Capitalism by Yanis Varoufakis. Okay. Um, for those who don't know, Yanis Varoufakis is a very uh, prominent and influential uh, uh, economist and philosopher and politician of the left. Um, he was the former finance minister of Greece during okay. the Eurozone crisis uh, in the post-2008 crash. Um, so, And now he runs uh, a political party, I think it's called DiEM25, um, which is arguing for a sort of resurgence of um, you know, democratic socialist ideals or social democracy and improved democracy in Europe. Um, they do. I think they may have some members in the European Parliament. I'm not sure. Um, okay. But DiEM25 is kind of a big deal. And in the U.S., I think he's a part of something called the Progressive International. Um, so Yanis Varoufakis is this guy who, who was an economist. He was in academia for years. And then because of the crisis of 2008, people were, you know, it's that classic idea, you know, in times of crisis, people look for the ideas 
that are floating around. And in the case yep. of him, he was somebody who was being very prominently explaining the problems in relating to the Eurozone crisis, the Eurozone debt crisis, specifically in Greece, post two, the 2008 um, right. crash. And so he becomes finance minister and kind of learns firsthand how truly kind of awful and corrupt uh, that the <laughs> international political system is and uh, and writes about that. I think he's written a book, a couple different books about that. I think the one he wrote about his time doing that stuff is called Adults in the Room. Um, okay. But he's written about a lot of those different things, but this is his newest book. Um, I think it came out in the UK or in Europe like in 2023, and I think it just came out in the US this year or, so or, pretty or new last then. year. So it's a very new, very new book. Um, and I think that people have been wondering for a while, you know, and maybe it's, maybe it's vibes. I don't know. I, I follow so enough social media to get a sense, but people have a sense that is capitalism dead and has it been replaced with something worse? And, and I do think that we are in a period of transition. I do think that the neoliberal order that we've lived under for nearly 50 years is falling apart. Um, the sort of that the reliance upon, you know, deregulation and austerity and um, free trade and all of that is falling apart. Um, and we're seeing increasing amounts of economic uh, and political protectionism um, and more yeah. economic nationalism. So that's certainly happening. The question is, is capitalism still capitalism? Mm -hmm. And for Yanis Varoufakis, he basically says it's not. That what we live okay. in now is something very, very different. Now, he's not the first person to say this. Um, there have been a lot of different people who have written about this. The one that I knew about years ago uh, that came out maybe five, six years ago is Mac uh, Mackenzie Wark's book, um, Is Cap Capital is Dead? Is This Worse? Or something okay. like that in the book. Now, she, her own term for this is what she calls like vectoralism or vectorism, where the, the, the real the real commodity in our future is information. Mm. Um, and so that is kind of where, instead of it being a reliance upon capital as sort of raw materials or industri industrial plant or labor or whatever, that you would have this reliance upon information and that that fundamentally changes um, our political economy. So like people have talked about this before, yeah. but the term techno-feudalism has been kind of you know, bandied about you know, somewhere on the internet and, and people have talked about it. And so I think Yanis Varoufakis in this book kind of lays out, well, what could that mean? So if mm -hmm. capitalism is dead and it's been replaced with this, what is this? And in order to get a sense of where he's coming from, there's a question that I think about a lot and we've talked about it on the show is why do so many of these tech companies not generate any profit? This is something we talk a lot about. You know, profits yeah. are indispensable to the capitalist system. Yeah. In order, you have to extract surplus value. That is, that's the whole game. Yeah, exactly. And so, and so why are these firms not really profitable? We've talked about for years that Uber wasn't really profitable at all. Yeah. Um, the rideshare company or that Amazon wasn't profitable at all. Right. For or, a long time. Twitter has never been profitable, period. Right. That's so how does it still exist? So how does it still <laughs> exist, right? So if they're not predicated upon profit, what are they predicated on? And this is where I think Giannis Varoufakis really hits the nail on the head, because I do mm -hmm. think on some fundamental le level, the economic system that we live in is very, very different than the one, say, 20, 30, or 40 years ago. It's very, very different. Right. And what makes it different is that it's a economic order that is moving away from profit, according to, to Varoufakis, it's one that's moving away from profit to one that's moving towards rent. Mm -hmm. So this is where the feudalism component comes in. So what is feudalism? Feudalism is the economic system that pre predominated in Europe pre-capitalism. So this right. is the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages in through the Renaissance. And what feudalism was, was that you had these feudal lords who owned the land and then you had the vassals who were sort of the middle managers who worked for the lords. Yeah. And then you had the serfs. And the serfs cultivated the land. They created the, the value. And that surplus, the vast majority of it went back to the lord in the form yeah. of rents. So rents on the land, rents on the 
output of your of your land, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. That system breaks down as a result of both the feudal uprisings that happen in the 13th century, which we talked about in in the episode about degrowth. Um, right. Jason Hickel's excellent book. We've talked a little bit about this. The destruction of the enclosures, the development of private property, and so on. Yeah. It took away the system of the Lord that was constantly just usurping from yeah. the peasant, peasant class, the peasantry, in the form of rents, into what would become capitalism, which was is an economic system predicated on the private ownership of the means of production and the generation of surplus value or profit. So we're now moving back according to Varoufakis, we're moving back to a system that's more feudal, where okay. these very large tech firms that dominate our lives, whether it's Apple, Facebook, um, which is now Meta, that's the yeah. broader, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, um, Twitter, uh, Google, especially Google. Right. Um, all of these companies, Amazon, all of these companies are what are, are sort of a new class. And Verifakis calls them the cloudalists. So okay. what they have is not capital, but it's, it's evolved into something different. And that's called cloud capital. And cloud capital is using the newly developed technologies of the cloud, the digital commons that we're all in all the time, mm-hmm. and the use of algorithms to manipulate people, which then generates a form of rent. So for example, when you and I do these shows and we put them out on YouTube, we don't make any money off of them. Right. You know, you're not any, not yet anyway. Um, And even if we did, it would be very little compared to what the value of what we've produced. Right. You know, because there's a difference between sort of basic labor you know, labor, you know, there's labor and then there's labor power. And those are two different things. Um, I think uh, Verifakis calls labor power, which is Marx's term. He calls it experiential labor. It's that you and I are, are collaborating together in an enterprise that requires mental work. Right. Well, that, that we're, you know, I'm reading a book, I'm reviewing a book, I'm kind of laying out the main points. I'm, I'm giving you a perspective on it. That takes mental labor that you can't just do, uh, that people just can't like do normally. Like it's something it's, it requires inspiration. It requires critical thinking. It requires, uh, uh, uh contemplative attitude. It requires all of those things, certain yeah. level of education, so on. And now we're living in a world where all of that experiential labor that we used to just do in our lives, whether it was talking to friends or, taking yeah. photographs or whatever, when we put it out in the world, whether it's this video or it's a photograph or it's an Instagram post or a Twitter post, or we purchase something on Amazon, we are adding to the cloud capital and we're not actually right. benefiting from it. Yeah. And so somebody's is, making money off of it. Just somebody not makes it. <laughs> and so there is, you know, it's that classic thing of like, well, if you're not paying for it, then you are the product. You're yeah. not the customer. Right. And that's true. And so we have a new world that is predicated on cloud rent. Mm-hmm. So we live in a world now where what is cloud rent? In Verifakis's thinking, cloud rent is the surplus that is extracted from people essentially without their consent and without their knowledge, and they're not being remunerated for it in any way. In right. a t- traditional capitalist firm, you exchange your labor power for a wage. Now, is that yeah. wage less than what your overall value of your labor is worth? Absolutely. Sure. That's where surplus value comes in. That's profit. But in this system, you're doing a ton of this work for free. Yeah. So, you know, every time that you make an Instagram post, every time you post on Twitter, every time you post on Facebook, every time you buy something on Amazon, every time that you do a Google search, every time that you make a Google Doc, or Google Sheets, or you know, or Google Slides. Anytime you you use these services, which are, are free to you, they are extracting cloud rent from you in the form of data, right? Because everything that you do on the internet leaves a trail, and yeah. that trail creates a digital footprint that people can that firms can then use to their advantage in the form of creating very sophisticated algorithms 
that in some respects may know you better than you know yourself in the sense of what you might buy next, in the sense of what you may look for next, and so on. What blew my mind today, blew my mind today, was, and we've all had these experiences. Yeah. I was going to make something in an air fryer, and I wanted to know if I could put foil in an air fryer. Okay. So I just start typing, can you put into Google? And the foil first an result I see is, can I put foil in an air fryer? Yeah, and it like, freaks me the fuck out. That's pretty wild. Yeah. And so you're like, and, and we've all experienced these things where we're like, these things know us better than we do. Yeah. So they're constantly extracting information from us that we are not paid for. Yeah. And that, in a sense, makes us cloud surfs. That's, that's his term for it. Okay. So you have the cloud surfs, you have the cloud lists at the top, the people who are benefiting from this. Right. You know, that's Google, that's Amazon, that's Meta, that's Twitter. Right? Those are They're our benefiting lords. from that. <laughs> Those are our lords. Those are the cloud lords. Um, and then you have the sort of cloud vassals. They're the people in the middle. So, for example, Verifacus uses the example that when you buy something on Amazon, right, you know there's an option you can buy directly from Amazon or you can buy it from a seller. But when you buy it from a seller, you don't talk to that seller. You don't. You it don't, still goes you, through Amazon. It still goes through Amazon and Amazon yeah. gets a cut. That's yeah. the rent. It's extracting rent. That's how it makes its money. These firms make their money by extracting rents rather than generating profits. The profits are just a night and they do generate profits. Some of them do. And they prove it. You know, Meta has had excellent profits over the last couple of years. Amazon has started to have incredible profits over the last few years. Yeah. Uber is starting to generate a profit, albeit a small one. Um, but for years and years and years, these companies weren't generating a profit. So why did people think of them so highly? It was because of their capacity to extract rents from us. Yeah. yeah. That's what makes them very, very different. Um and on that, I'll kind of stop there real quick and see if there's anybody who's joining us and uh, there's any there's questions or comments. Just one uh, comment. Uh, American Castles said, excited for this. I'm currently reading Vera Fakis's, uh book, Global Minotaur. Oh, yes. The Global Minotaur. That's a, thank you for your comment. Thank you for listening. Um, that's a great segue into talking about what he calls the Global Minotaur. Global okay. Minotaur. So the Global Minotaur is essentially his description for neoliberalism that you know the at the peak of the golden age of capitalism of global capitalism post world war 2 it was predicated upon very clear rules and those were the bretton woods rules the bretton woods system and we've talked a little bit about this before yeah. maybe in the Dave Harvey episode and i know yeah. i've brought it up in other times too but the bretton woods economic order was developed and one of the lead organizers of the bretton woods system was john maynard keynes the british economist very influential in the 20th century. Um, but the Bretton Woods system made very clear guidelines about what capital could and could not do. Right. So one example of that was capital controls. Under the Bretton Woods system, there were capital controls. There was so basically for for every dollar that was used, it was backed up by a, you know, there was a very fixed ratio. So for every dollar, it was worth this many in a what other currency. Um, and I think for, for Giannis Varoufakis, he uses the drachma, which was the Greek currency before it became the euro. Okay. And so like for every $1, there's 30 drachmas or whatever. Like it's a set, it's a fixed rate. This also meant that capital firms, so that's one form of the capital control. The other form of capital control was that there were certain things you couldn't do with mm. the global financial system. You couldn't, uh, in the United States, you couldn't. Uh, there was a clear wall of separation between commercial banks, like your local bank you go to, that you would get a loan from, that you would have your checking account in, and and uh, investment banks, um, banks that that primarily were involved in financial instruments, stocks, treasury bonds, so on. You know, the global minotaur is the is what comes out of the destruction of the Bretton Woods system. Uh -huh. Bretton Woods system dies in 1971 when. Richard Nixon takes the United States off of the gold standard that was set by the Bretton Woods system. Right. That under the Bretton Woods system, the U.S. dollars were always backed by gold. Yeah. And so a U.S. a U.S. dollar was a fixed amount of gold, no matter where you were in the world. So the, it, made, it made it very enticing to have U.S. dollars because you could exchange those for gold. Right. Once you got rid of that rule, the only thing you could exchange U.S. dollars for were goods. 
And so this is where all of that excess American capital goes. It goes towards the development of the global mentor, i.e. the development of these countries like China and India and, and other parts of Southeast Asia, Singapore, South Korea, that right. develop these economic behemoths. Because yeah. those U.S. dollars have to go somewhere. Yeah. Because now that they're no longer backed by gold, they have to be backed by something else, which is essentially the full faith and credit of the United States, i.e. vibes. Right. And so, uh, you know, and so the global minotaur is neoliberalism. It's the neoliberal order. It is getting rid of capital controls, getting rid of financial regulations, opening up the world for trade and the and the dark deal, as he calls it, between the U.S. and China, that, okay. um, where basically in order for the U.S. to maintain its economic dominance, it had to start exporting a lot of its manufacturing facilities to China. In exchange yep. for cheap goods, the U.S. had um, a, a way to be able to have their currency be worth something in the global marketplace because you could exchange it for those goods. And so, yeah, the global minotaur is his description of the world we're living in, but that's starting to break down. Right. And, and I've said this for a long time, like that I think neoliberalism is dying. I think it is, it is almost... I think the fact that Joe Biden is president, he's like the perfect metaphor for it because he's this old <laughs> husk of a human being that just keeps plugging along. Everyone knows that he probably shouldn't be, but yeah. he is anyway. He's yeah. like the perfect metaphor for where neoliberalism is, and which is ironic because he's one of neoliberals, neoliberalism's architects in America when he was the senator from Delaware. So, um, so the cloudalists, these people are extracting rents from us. and what do we get in exchange? Quite frankly, very little other than just free things that we can use. Yeah. Now, let's just be frank. Like, I'm going to throw this question to you, and I have my answer for this. If instead of the, the, the sort of the, the, I don't know, like the, the, the crossroads deal where we sell our soul to the devil, i.e. the algorithm, would you rather just pay $5 a month to have Google? instead of them constantly absorbing your fucking data all the time and ruining your sense of privacy. Sure. Wouldn't you much rather <laughs> just pay for this? Yep. I would too. In fact, I, I, I do pay for Google. <laughs> <laughs> for like the cloud storage and the yep. fucking use of whatever. I, yes. I, I'm a subscriber to Google One or whatever it's called. Yes. Now. And that's also a form of rent. They're, yeah. they're extracting a rent from you because... It's not predicated on really giving you a, a good or a service other right. than one that exists kind of in the ether, in the cloud, right? Yeah. And so instead of you buying like storage space outright, which is kind of how it would be in the old capitalist system, yeah. you're in this new system where you're paying a rent on it. Yeah. Um, another great example of this was BMW, the, the car manufacturer, a few years ago, or this may have actually have been during COVID, but they announced something that like in their really fancy fucking cars, they have things like heated seats and yeah. things like that. They were going to start charging people to have the heated seats that they would extract a <sighs> rent from you in order to use your heated seats. Back, that's you some know, nasty shit. That it is, right? <laughs> and that's kind of the problem is that, um, you know, it's very little do regular ass people get this money very few people ever benefit from this yeah and in and arguably this is the system that kind of you know this new techno feudalism has killed capitalism it's dead yeah. verifacus um writes the book as if he's writing to his father so he's done this before he wrote a book called like writing to my daughter about the economy okay he did that and it's like it's like it's a book about what is capitalism and he kind of writes it as if he's talking to like his 12 year old daughter or something like that That's it's a cute book yeah Very good this book is him writing to his father who was someone who worked um at like a uh, like a metallurgy plant in greece um oh. his father was a resistance fighter in world war ii um he had spent time in, in uh, as a as a critic of stalin he had spent some time in, the, in like the Gulag and then actually came back. He was a part of the, the, the Greek left for many, many years. And, um, and so he's writing it as if he's talking to his dad. Because right. his dad had the question of, will capitalism ever die? Will it die? And for a lot of us, you know, who are sort of on the left are thinking is yes, but it's replaced by socialism. 
yeah. that at some point um, that there's this critical mass where quantity changes into quality, as we talk about with Hegel, right? It's like yeah. the Marx dialectic, right? That things change enough that you get to a place where you're like, oh, this is a fundamentally different system. And so <laughs> Yannis Varoufakis says, to answer your question, Dad, the answer is yes, but not in the way you thought it would. <laughs> not the way we wanted it to. Not the way we wanted it to. Fuck. <laughs> and so I think part of this is right. I think that if you look at Silicon Valley, for example, and I'm really interested in learning more and more about the tech industry because I think it dominates the U.S. economy. I think to understand where the U.S. economy is at any given time, it's to understand Silicon Valley and the tech industry in general. Um, because for the last 30 years, 40 years, you know, the U.S. economy has kind of gone all in on mm. Silicon Valley and big tech. Yeah. And this is especially the case starting in the late 2000s and into the 2010s under the Obama administration. This is very much the case where they have very cozy relationships with people at Apple, at Amazon, Google, Facebook. All these people are really tuned in to yeah. the sort of, you know, the, the neoliberal elite. Um, and I think there is a sense in which we are in a very different place precisely because it doesn't function the way that capitalism normally does. Right. So, you know, profits, those aren't really a big deal anymore because if a, if a, <laughs> a lot of it's also predicated on, on public money, which is very, very different too. Like capitalist firms before would often have to go to banks to get loans to then start businesses and so on. And that's still right. the case today. But the difference is, is that um, in times of crisis, the, the old Keynesian logic was you pump money into the system and you give it to the people. You, you pump it into yeah. small business. You pump it into the middle class. You pump it into the working poor. You pump it into those people because they're going to be the ones spending the money and making the economy go. Yep. That was the logic behind the New Deal. That was the logic behind Bret Woods. And that was the logic behind the peak of the golden era of capitalism post-World War II. <laughs> Because Keynes understood how the economy works. <laughs> because Keynes understands how the money, the, the economy actually worked, which is that if you act, if you actually create an economy that benefits the vast majority, it benefits everyone. Yeah. Everyone does well in that system. And it, it um, always requires circulation. It requires moving money. Moving money around. With the 2008 recession, something fundamentally changed yeah. where we saw low record low interest rates sometimes negative interest rates out of central banks but at the same time and you'd see this flood of money into the system for years and years and years and years all this really really cheap money yeah and yet inflation was maintained until now I mean, we're, we're dealing with inflation over the last couple of, uh, last few years now largely as a result of covid but also some of it's just good old-fashioned price gouging on the yeah. on the on the on the <laughs> on the, uh, the plan of the capitalists but with all this public money flowing in, it's pumping up all these industries that wouldn't have been pumped up otherwise. Yeah. So you're seeing that's a very, very big difference where you're seeing public money instead of it being directed towards the development of a broader, broader commonwealth, it's, it's actually glorifying, it's, it's sort of a glorified money laundering where you're just kind of going in and you're, you're pumping all of this money into these firms that, quite frankly, would never have gotten it on a on a marketplace. Like, yeah. you know, and that's yeah. the other thing, too, is that like markets are dying, like capitalism is predicated on some in some respects on markets. And I, I'll tell you right now, capitalism is not markets. Right. They're separate. You know? But capitalism separate. requires markets. Capitalism does require markets in order to work the way that they want it to. Like yeah. in ideal situations. Right. You have you have. Competition. Competition inspires innovation and entrepreneurship. Old yeah. firms are replaced by new firms. Creative destruction, all of that. That's the, the point. Idea. Yeah. That's the point. But we live in a system where it is increasingly cartelized, where antitrust laws are not being enforced. And it is, um, it is truly, as we talked about in a previous episode, it's a choke point. Yeah. And you have all these choke points within the economy. And what do these choke points exist to do? Extract rent. Extract rent. <laughs> That's why yeah. they exist. Yeah. Right. So when like Ticketmaster is a good example of this. Like yeah. when you go and buy tickets on Ticketmaster, there's all these random fees. And you're like, some of these are connected to something, right? Like there's a facility fee or there's state taxes or whatever, right? 
And because a lot of times in these firm, in these companies, they'll make you pay for the taxes. When right. you buy a cell phone, that's how it is, right? Like if you buy, like I, I got my phone at at t When you set up a phone plan and you buy a new phone, you pay for the taxes to have your phone turned on. Yeah. The, the at t doesn't pay those. You do. And yeah. they put that in like the itemized receipt. So it's all these rents that they extract from you because they get them up front because they're not going to get them again. Um, but when it comes to things like Google or Amazon or, um, or, or Meta or whatever, they're extracting rent all the time, either in the form of fees. So for example, like with, with Twitter's $8 like check fee thing, right. um, Meta has the same thing. Verification costs $15 a month. Um, to get a little blue check. You'll never get my fucking $15. You will never get my money. First off, I can just take the little blue check mark code and put it in my name. And then it just right. looks like I, I have it, right? Yeah. But they also, in order for you to get certain features of yeah. Instagram or Facebook, you have to pay for this. And so there are things that they could just give it to you and they would have given to you if you had just paid for it outright. Yeah. But, you know... Um, but you can't now under the system. Adobe is a good example of this, a software company. Right. Yeah. Back in the day when you used to get Photoshop on your computer, you, you would down, you would buy the software package yep. and you would download it and you would own that software package. As long as you had your, your, your serial key and as long as you had your software disk or saved it somewhere else, you can install that version of Photoshop on as many computers as you wanted yeah. um, in perpetuity. That was because yeah. you bought it, you own it. I still have a very old version of Photoshop because of that. I do too. <laughs> my my wife downloaded one when we were in, in college 15 years ago. Yeah. It's like, it's like CS6. And, uh, yeah, and I think six is the one I have. Too. And uh, if I were to get it out of my external hard drive and pop it in, I could probably do it. Adobe recently, now this isn't in the book, but this is very telling because it adds more evidence to Farrah Fox's thesis that Adobe is going to start going after people for doing that. That if you, oh, if you start to download it and if you've downloaded an old version of Photoshop and you install it on a computer, they are going to try to go after that as a form of piracy. Now, it's not yeah. a form of pri pri piracy because you bought it. Right. But that's the thing is that in capitalism, the way it works is if you bought something, it's yours. You owned it. Right. So yeah. like if you buy a water bottle, you buy the water bottle, it's yours. If you buy, yeah. you know, two lotion or pens or whatever, I'm just naming things on my table here, but like, <laughs> you know, um, but soon you, it'll be rents for all of it. Rents for all of yeah. it. Um, your pen won't work if you don't pay your fee. <laughs> exactly. And so your pen won't work if you don't pay a fee, if you don't, um, if you want to have your ass a little warm in the morning on, in your BMW, you have to pay an extra fee to do that instead of it just yep. being something you buy. So we're living in a world where that's the case. One thing you're seeing a lot, and it's something my wife and I are big about, is the resurgence of physical media. So people are realizing that streamers suck. Uh, it's basically reinventing cable, but it's worse because it's it more expensive. And you, in some respects, get less for it than you did when you had cable. And people are going back and they're buying DVDs or they're buying Blu-rays or they're buying 4Ks or they're even buying VHS tapes. Yeah. And people are just going back and just being like, fuck this streaming shit. I'm just going to buy the physical media and then cut, cut the cord, kind of like what people did with cable years ago, yeah. where people cut the cable. And, the, and, and so, you know, when Cory Doctorow talks about his concept of in shitification, which... Giannis Varoufakis talks about in this book, and he doesn't like that term. He thinks it's like oh. <laughs> Um, Whereas he's like, well, it's not something you could say in front of your grandma. It's like, but that's the point. Like, right. you know, when you hear a word like in shitification, it makes sense. It's something getting worse and you're paying more for it, yeah. which is what the streamers are, right? Yep. It's what Google is. You know, Google is worse. Google search is worse today than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. Like without yeah. a doubt. You know, it's, it is so much, it's so flooded with sponsored content and ads AI and, and, and AI junk and all yeah. this crap that we don't want, you know, like Jim and I, the AI for Google. It's like, no one asked for any of this. Nope. I don't want this. First off, <laughs> it gets shit wrong all the time. There was a, a very interesting story recently about people were making fun of the fact that, you know, w this might be something that somebody made up, but it, but it does speak to a larger truth, which is, that these things hallucinate, like AI software, these large language models, which, come yeah. on, they're not really AI. This is the thing I keep stressing to people. Like, this is marketing. Yeah. When yeah. you hear all this stuff about AI, it's marketing. 
It's yeah. not really AI. Like the computer software that is, has these large language models are, are dumber than a box of rocks. What makes them work is constant human intervention into the system to make them work. Yeah. They wouldn't work otherwise. Yeah. So they're not very intelligent. And it's not artificial in the sense, like I said, people are constantly feeding into it. It's not really artificial either. Yeah. I, and uh, it's a whole, yeah. I was just going to say, like, I think uh, I heard, like, uh, the Google one, it's constantly giving wrong information. It'll it'll scrape. You'll ask it a question, and it'll give you some answer from Reddit from 30 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever the fuck it was. And, like, before the internet was even really a thing. So it's got this one fucking Reddit post that it's saying is the truth when it's just not. Right. And that or, was the uh, example. Yeah. Or, or I was just thinking, too, like, Grok. Uh, my partner got the blue check. Somebody paid for her blue check. So she okay. tried grok. She, she grokked my name and it, it mixed up both my information and this, uh, competition bass fisherman's information. <laughs> so it's like talking about this bass fisherman winning these competitions, but also wait, he's also got some interesting opinions about politics. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you're you're better off having the bass fisherman because the most famous person that when you type in my name is Trump's campaign manager in 2020. Oh no! <laughs> so whose name is Justin Clark? So that's the number one that you get. Um, although, if you, I do believe that if you do type in Justin Clark on Google, and it might be biased mainly just because, like, you know how it works. Like Google searches aren't universal for everyone. It's not the yeah. same thing for everybody. But like. If you type in, you know, Justin Clark on Google, um, you know, the third result is me. Right. Where are um, you in the, in the search results? Eh? But like, yeah. if you typed my name into Google, would you get the same result as I do? Probably I'm, not. I might even get you first. <laughs> yeah. You might even get me first. Right. Because that Trump campaign manager doesn't mean anything to you because you're Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So. Those are the challenges, right? Where it's like, we're seeing these products getting worse and worse and worse. But in order for them to be back to what they used to be, you have to pay for it. And this is, a, this is the real rub of it, which is that there's a technologist named Jaron Lanier, who was kind of a pioneering, he's a pioneering guy in VR, and, and he's written a lot about technology. He made a point in one of his books, I can't remember if it's You're Not a Gadget or one of his other books, but he said the biggest mistake that the internet did in its early days was give every way, everything away for free because it's much, much harder yeah. to get people to pay for something after it's already been free. And I think that's the challenge. And then I think for us on the left, we ask that basic fundamental question of, well, why can't it be free? Right. Why, why can't it just be free? Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if information, you know, and so. Because of course it can. Because <laughs> it can, you know, and and so. Um, but at the same time, and I love Cory Doctorow's other quote on this, which is information doesn't want to be free. People do. Yeah. Information is doesn't want to be free in the sense that information doesn't want anything. It's not exactly. sentient. Yeah. It's like these AI software programs. They're not sentient. They, they're they not. And that's, I think, really the my criticism of the book, because I think that, do I think we live in techno feudalism? No, I think this is just another word to describe hyper centralized monopoly capitalism right. with like a little bit of tech. Yeah. The tech you know, stuff involved. Yeah. You know, tech sprinklings of, you know, a little bit of, I don't know what, what they call it. Um, confetti or, you know, glitter sure. on top. It's not, you know, I think that if you look at see the history of American capitalism, for example, look at standard oil, Standard Oil, you know, before it was broken up in the 1910s, Standard Oil accounted for, I think, 90 to 95% of the entire oil market in the United States, period. Now, in order for other firms to break in to the right. space, they had in order to be a part of Standard Oil or benefit from Standard Oil, you had to pay fees to Rockefeller. You had to pay fees to Standard Oil to be involved in the market specifically in regards to the rail lines and the pipelines. Right. So if you were a refiner, because that's where, that's where Rockefeller made his money. This was his genius, was he didn't make his money finding oil. He made his money refining it. He realized mm -hmm. that finding oil is a very dangerous, risky, and unpredictable business. What I'm going to do is make it useful. So one of the first things he developed was kerosene. 
kerosene was something that's developed from oil. It's a byproduct of oil. Gasoline itself yeah. was a, was seen originally as a waste product. Right. It was something was it was it was created in the process of creating other things with petroleum. And people say, well, this isn't worth anything. So they used to just dump it because it was not worth anything until cars. Yeah. Cars made gasoline, which it, which before then had been waste product into something that may have been even more profitable and more impactful than oil itself. Yeah. And so the reason I'm mentioning all of this is that he had a virtual monopoly and he was extracting rents as a result of it. Yeah. Same with Cornelius Vanderbilt with the railroad railroad lines. He was extracting rents for people to to in order for them to go on his rail. Yep. If you look at Carnegie Steel and Andrew Carnegie, he had people had to pay rents in order to use the Bessemer process because he had he had copyrighted it. He had patented it. Patents are a great example of this too. You have to pay fees in order to use certain things that have been patented until they fall out of patent. Right. Until they fall out of patent protection. So there's all kinds of ways in which capitalism has always constantly extracted rent. Yeah, that's kind of part of the whole game, right? Is extracting yeah. rents from every aspect that you can. But what I think Varoufakis' argument is, it's like, but rents were always seen as kind of this like dirty thing in capitalism. That like the real goal was to have profits. That profits mm. were really the more important thing. But I don't know if that's necessarily true because like rents can be a form of profit in and of themselves. Yeah. A good example of this is, Amazon doesn't make money really through the website. It doesn't really make that much money through selling you shit on Amazon.com. Amazon makes the vast majority of its money on AWS, on Amazon Web Services. Oh, yeah. It's cloud ba- it's, it's cloud and, and server architecture, right? I think, you know, Netflix, basically Netflix runs on AWS. A right. huge amount of the, the Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Defense runs on AWS. So it's like, that's, you know, that's a way of extracting rents, but overall they actually add up into the overall profit of the firm. Yeah. And if you look at the name of the game is most companies have a fiduciary responsibility, fiduciary meaning that like they have an obligation under law, under corporate law or under the law of the, or under the regulation of a firm um, to provide profit. So what what is like, what is like, investment income if not a type of rent right like- exactly that's right <laughs> and he does mention some of that he talks about the different types of rents you know so there's like the rent that you would pay you know to your landlord but then there's like a rent that you would pay in the form of taxes taxes are a form of rent essentially shareholders um, get paid dividends shareholders that's have rent. to pay dividends that's a yeah. form of rents like yeah. there's all kinds of ways in which rent is built into capitalism yeah i also think that he overplays the importance of algorithms. I, oh. I do think they're, I think they're very important. And I know that there are computer scientists who are like, who, who the fuck is this moron talking about this? He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> right. But like in general, right? Like if you look at a lot of the firms that make serious money, whether it's oil firms um, or, you know, uh, or if you look at financial firms, a lot of times they're doing work that's still very human oriented where people are right. doing the work, right? The, it's really only in big tech. It's in the big tech firms where these things matter. Yeah. And and I think that ultimately, in my opinion, at least, I think that techno feudalism is a way you could describe the world that we live in. But has it really killed capitalism? No. Like it's and part of it is it's because kind of in it. <laughs> it's in it. It's built into the system. The other thing is, and this is where we're going to go back again to Jason Hickel. Yes, profit is a big part of capitalism. But what else is a big part of capitalism? Growth. Yeah. Growth is a big part of capitalism. And he, Varoufakis, rarely mentions uh, growth at all, Um, which is odd because I'm like, wait, growth is a big part of this. Yeah. Whether it's compound growth, compound interest, compound, you know, compounded, you know, compounded returns, like all of those things matter. Yeah. The growth, the incentive for growth is very much in the big tech firms, right? Right. In fact, part of the reason why Amazon didn't have profits for many years was because it put that money back into the company to grow it, Yeah. which is how it works. You, a company can be either not profitable or marginally profitable for many years until it gets to kind of a, you know, a, a sort of breaking point, a tipping point where it then makes a ton of money. And that's where Amazon is now. Yeah. You know, that's where, you know, that is where um, a lot of these tech firms are at now. 
And so, um, but I do think that the fact that we are moving away from a society that owns things to a society that constantly rents things is a problem in yeah. the sense that you're paying for something that would probably either be free or near free yeah. that you didn't have to pay for before. Yeah. I think of like, uh, it's, it's another doctoral book, but like yeah. you wrote a story, a short story about like uh, a society in which you have to have the right program for your toast and you have to use program bread, the specific bread. And that's, you know, so the rent is being extracted in many, many ways, but it's still capitalism, right? Like, yeah. so it's, but yeah, it's every aspect of your life. It has this, you have to pay to use it. So yeah, uh, level at it. I do think where Verifocus is right is that like when you enter amazon.com, you exit the market. I think that's true. Yeah. In the sense that when they have like the Amazon marketplace, you know, those are the cloud vassals. They're the middle right. people, right? So that so the small capitalist firm or the capitalist firm that's selling, I don't know, like iPhone chargers or they're selling you know, I don't know, they're selling like picture frames or something like that. The, or you're buying a, a book or you're buying something from a different firm. You you have to play by Amazon's rules. You have to pay you have to pay Amazon set fees. You have to you have to follow their guidelines. Yeah, it's not a real market in the sense that like, oh, I can take the price down because I'm not going to pay them this fee. It's like well, you actually have to pay the fee in order to participate in the marketplace. Yeah, the costs that, that are added on make you have to charge a certain minimum fee, sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, and the thing is, is that like. Amazon didn't do, isn't like the pioneer of this. The real pioneer of this was Walmart. Mm -hmm. Walmart was the pioneer of like telling suppliers that you have to hit certain number, you have to hit certain price points or yeah. we will not sell your product in store, period. Yeah. And you could make the argument on some level that once you enter a Walmart, you exit the market too. Yeah, that's that, right. That it's not a real market because no. it's, the stuff is being sold on the diktats of Walmart. Same with Amazon, yeah. you know? But the problem with that is that that's how capitalism has always been. You know, if you worked with Standard Oil, you had to yeah. follow Standard Oil's rules. If you wanted to work with Carnegie, you had to follow you had to follow U.S. Steel's rules. If you wanted to work with if you wanted to work with Vanderbilt and the rails, you had to follow Vanderbilt's rules. Yeah, the market like isn't the market isn't within Walmart or within uh, Amazon. It's be I guess between them. Yeah. That's right. So, and we talked about this in the People's Republic of Walmart episode that like right. Walmart is not a market. It's a very well-oiled planned machine. Yeah. You know, so is Amazon. They're not markets and they're extracting rents from vassals essentially and from the serfs who are, you know, who are feeding into the system. If you go yeah. in and buy something in, in Walmart, you are effectively underwriting not just the cost of the product that you purchase, but the cost of the firm continuing. That's built into capitalism itself. Yeah. So the fact that you, the fact that wage labor is still a thing, that people have to exchange their labor power for a wage, that's capitalism. Most people yeah. still have to do that. Yeah. You know, the vast majority of people on planet Earth have to do that. You know, um, it would truly be a form of feudalism if like all of our lives were controlled by the corporations, that the house we lived in was owned by the corporation. Uh, the same tech firm that like owned your phone and like owned your house or whatever yeah. it was all one firm. It was a, like a company town back yeah, in the day, like that's right. were, it, like in Lowell, Massachusetts. Which is, I mean, Poland. that's what the libertarians want, right? Yes. <laughs> essentially, if you break it down, like right libertarians essentially want to reassert a form of feudalism. Yeah. Um, they talk about it being a form of early capitalism, but in a lot of ways, they want to bring back a feudal system. Yeah, the, I mean, early capitalism. And feudalism. Early capitalism, <laughs> feudalism. And again, there aren't very clear lines. It's very much like evolution, right? It's not like yeah. a clear ascent of man. It's much more of like a tree. Yeah, exactly. So like you could say that within capitalism as we know it, there are forms of things that are techno-feudalism. I would think that's right in yeah. the extent of, of rent being the priority over profits in yeah. some aspects. But the fact that Amazon generates profit and the fact that Meta generates profit and they provide returns to their shelters based on generating a profit, yeah. that's not feudalism. That's right. capitalism. Yeah. And, and, it, and, and, it, and to me, there's not that much of, a, of a, a real difference between whether the capital is like industrial capital in the form of like owning a factory 
and owning cloud computing. Like those are right. They're just different forms, but they effectively do the same thing. Yeah, that's right. So that's that's really where my criticisms are. But I do think he's right in the sense that um, we are in a new phase where capitalism is less predicated on the sort of self-interested, like homo economicus, that sort of rational, right. self-interested individual within the society itself. That's done. Like that right. That was always kind of a story, but it's definitely way more of a story now. Yeah. Like we, there's so many of these things where they're extracting rent and we don't have a choice. No. But to pay it. We Exactly. You know, it's, it's I'm giving you an offer you can't refuse, right? It's very yeah. mafia-like. Um, before we talk a little bit about the last parts of the book, do we have any comments, questions? Uh, just nonsequently came in a little while ago, said, gave us a wave. Hello. Thanks for being here. That's about it. Um, that's about it. Okay, cool. Um, and so, um, I know this isn't as, I guess this isn't as sexy as talking about Lenin, but <laughs> I guess, <laughs> I, guess. Yeah. Um, I guess, but anyway, um, <laughs> so The last stuff I'll talk about is why is the U.S. and Europe broadly, why are they doing a new Cold War with China? That is a good question. That's a very good question. This is part of the later latter part of the book that he gets into. And I think he's really, really spot on on this. The reason that the U.S. because the the kind of bullshit reasons that they give of like, well, we care about Taiwan. It's like, well, Taiwan's been Taiwan since the 1950s. That's always been or security (laughs) or whatever. It's none of that. Like, that's I don't believe any of that. (laughs) That's all nonsense. The real reason that the United States is fighting a a global sort of cold war with China is because the only other country that can create the levels of cloud capital that the United States does is China. It's the only one. And in some respects, they do it even better than the United States does. So one of the things that that China has done recently that's kind of mind blowing is a digital currency that is issued by the Bank of China. Ah. So in the United States, the way that the United States financial system works, you have the Federal Reserve, which is this sort of quasi-public, quasi-private bank that determines the money supply. And it is the official instant, it's the issuer of the currency. And then you have banks. and And then you have you. There's always the banking. The private banking is always the intermediary, skimming a little bit off the top every time. What this digital currency in China does is it gets rid of the middleman Mm, where mm. you can use an app to send money to people without some financial institution skimming off the top without them getting some benefit from it because it's a fully public good. Now, Varoufakis makes the argument that like, this is actually a good thing and could be used in the form of socialism that we have public banking where people could do public banking of this sort would be fantastic. Um, But under a, a sort of a state capitalist system like China, Maybe it's not so great in the sense that um, it is a form of cloud capital and it's right. a form of, again, of, of abstracting rent. But instead of private firms doing it, it's the state doing it, which can right. be its own problem. Yeah. Now, one thing that he mentions is that in China, the major app that most people use is WeChat, which is something you've probably heard of or people have talked about. But WeChat is like the app that everybody uses in China because WeChat does everything. So like here in the US, we have like Netflix, you have YouTube, and you got like Amazon, and you've got Uber, and you've got all of those, and they're all like different. Yeah. You can do all of those things in WeChat. It's all ah. there, all in one place. Pretty handy. And so it is very, very handy. And the fact that it can do all of those things all at once, and that it's an app that's not in the United States, that was developed by the Chinese, that is owned by Chinese capitalists, that is not at the whims of big tech in the United States. And so that's part of the reason that we've seen the backlash to TikTok. It's not because TikTok violates people's privacy and recreates a lot of the same problems of cloud capital um, and sort of rent extraction, as as Varoufakis calls it. Well, we know the U.S. state doesn't care about any of that. They give two shits about any of that, right? Because they're not going to pass any broad online privacy protections like you did. They're not going to do it, right? Because they don't give a fuck. What they care about is the fact that all this rent seeking that you can do through these tech firms is being done by a Chinese firm and not one in the U.S. That's yeah. what they don't like. Yeah. And so the Cold War between China and the U.S. is the is of there's a myriad of other factors that go into that, whether it's shipping lanes and and territorial sovereignty and all of that. But a big part of it is this this technological war because China has had a place for a very very long time. China was dependent upon U.S. technology. It is no longer. 
It can develop its own. Yeah. It can develop its own technological firms. It can develop its own microchips. It can do all those things. In fact, the electric car that yeah. China sells, BYD, people say it's even better than Tesla. People say like BYD is the best electric car you can buy on the market, period. Yep. And it's supposed to be like actually affordable and like it's like the game changer. Yeah. It's yeah. BYD is the real Henry They'll Ford. They'll never let it over here if they can stop it. <laughs> and the Biden administration did something that is very un-Biden-like. You know, in the years and years and years of his neoliberalism and his free trade and all of that, yeah. he passed a 100% tariff executive order on BYD products. Of course. So if you buy a BYD car, effectively banning BYD cars from yeah. the market. Yeah. Now, this is protectionism pure and simple, right? Yeah. This is the same thing they're trying to do with TikTok and, and, and the banning of TikTok, which is what really what it really is. It's not a ban, but it's it's an ultimatum that TikTok has to sell its Chinese sell, components to a U.S. Yeah. firm. Yeah. Essentially, the, the, the political class in America is like, we don't want the Chinese owning it. We want Zuckerberg to own it. Yeah. Or we want or we want, yeah. you know, Sashi Nadella at, at Microsoft to own it or Sundar Pichai at Google to own it. That's what they want. It's It's xenophobia. That's what it is ultimately. Yeah, it's xenophobia mixed with the fact that, that a lot of American firms know that the that the Chinese could take their ass to the cleaners, which is kind of the other problem too. Yeah. That like Chinese capitalism fundamentally works better than American capitalism does for the vast majority of its because people. of the intervention of the state. Yes, because of the intervention <laughs> of the state. Now you can talk about the problems of China, and there are sure. myriad ones. Yep. Right. You it's know, not they, what I want. As a it's society. not what I would want, whether it's the oppression of minorities, the suicide nets at iPhone plants, like yeah. the, the horrific degradation and, and exploitation that workers experience in the system. All of that is not good. But those are all of the same things that also have happened in any other capitalist country and society ever, one. And two, yeah. the China has a much more robust state to in, count, counteract some of the abuses of capitalism. Yeah. Unlike the United States, which essentially moved away from doing that which it did in mid 20th century, the peak of American capitalism being basically working at its best. Yeah. So capitalism never worked better in America than when it did when it was when it was more managed by the state. Yep. Because capitalism requires the state. This is something that I, I cannot stress to people is that when like liber this is where like right libertarians are like absurd. They get everything ass backwards. Yep. Um, it's it's. States exist because of capital, yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. Like it's, it's, you know, and so capitalism from its very beginning was something that was built with state policy, the enclosures yeah. or economic protectionism, the mercantilist laws of England, you know, um, the corn laws banning certain things and certain products, yeah. you know, all of these are economic policies that states have done. Yeah. So that's where we're at. And I guess I think to close, basically in the last part of the book, he talks about, well, what could a techno socialist future look like? Okay. Um, because he's talked about basically what he wants is he, what he calls technological libertarian communism, where okay. you take the aspects of technology that could benefit us, that could create that abundant society, which we've talked about, like in the, our episode on Star Trek or sure. what we've talked about with, you know, Jason Hickel's book, that, like we could actually degrow the economy while meeting people's needs and then some, yeah. right? We could create a society of abundance and actually lower overall material throughput. Yeah. We could do that, yeah. but it requires certain forms of sacrifice, but not sacrifice of the poor and not sacrifice of the working class, but sacrifices of the, of the capitalists, yeah. sacrifices of the wealthy. And so he talks about how, you know, we can have um, public apps, which are run by the public. They're democratically owned and controlled where people could own their own data. Yeah. And if they wish to sell it, they can. And if they don't, that's fine. That there are certain stronger online privacy protections, that you have apps, uh, free public apps that allow you to find the best means of transportation. You know, instead of taking the Uber, you could get on public bus or you could get on a train. Right. All these kinds of different things. Public banking, that's another key component of it. Um, self worker, self management, self ownership. These are all things that we've talked about. This yep. is what I believe in. You know, the, the, the sort of socialist utopia, the socialist commonwealth, as I call it, is one where we have public banking, 
robust social de democratic provisions in the form of universal basic income, pensions, health care, education, all of that, mixed with robust public markets that are heavily regulated. So for the fun stuff that we want to buy, right. because socialism will be fun. This is the one yeah. thing I want people to understand <laughs> that like we will, yeah. you know, the socialism will not be drab and gray and Soviet. It will be fun. Like it'll yeah. actually be fun. We can make it fun. And the way that you make it fun is by some forms of markets. Yeah. Because I don't think markets, markets can exist within a socialist society and yeah. actually work better in a socialist society than they would under capitalism. Exactly. Because you would have more innovation, more entrepreneurship. You'd have more healthy forms of competition. Yep. And you'd have strong social democratic protections for those who don't win yeah. um, in, in the broader, in the forms of innovation. So that's the kind of world he wants to live in. That's the kind of world I want to live in. But that requires a broader political framework that goes beyond capitalism. And yeah. so if we really do live in this techno-feudal world, the way that we combat it is using it against itself. That we can use the abundant, that we could use the development of technologies, the development of algorithms, the development of cloud technologies, all these things, which to this point have been used for largely nefarious purposes. Yeah. They could be used to develop better economic planning policies, which can satisfy people's needs. Yeah. So those are kind of the things that I would like to see in the world. Um, I'm, I'm very pro technology. I always have been. Um, but I'm, but people often think of Luddites as being like that they hate technology. It's like, no, Luddites never hated technology. They were critical of it. They asked yeah. questions. Yeah. They were skeptical that it could achieve what people thought it could. They were against and, the exploitation of and use of the uh, uh, technology by capitalists, essentially. Yes. They were against those who were going to do them harm by instituting technologies into their society with no democratic input. Yeah. And I think that's really the relevant thing to think about tonight. And where maybe we are in more of a techno-feudal future is in the sense that most of these major technological changes that have happened in our lifetimes, no one voted on. No, no one asked right. for, no yeah. one said, let's do this. Yeah. It was a group of people who made these decisions for us without our consent. Yeah. And we sort of had to roll with it because what else could you do? You know, because here's the thing, even if you become like a total hermit and you're not on social media, you don't have a smartphone or anything like that, you're still at the whims of the electrical grid. You're still at the whims of cell phone towers. You're still at the yeah. whim of anything like that, yeah. you know? And so recognizing that technology is a partner in human progress. It's not the be all end all to human progress, right? It's a part of it. And I think that um, very much like capitalism, right? That socialism is built upon the bones of capitalism, right? That, that you know, the new world is, is, has the birth pangs of the old in it, as Marx would say. And I think the techno feudal world we live in could be this sort of cybernetic socialism, this sort of techno socialism, um, that uses all these technologies, but in the service of meeting human needs mm. and improving our environment and improving our lives. But that requires political movements, that requires change, that requires all the things that we talk about that are difficult, hard, that, yeah. uh, that are much bigger than all of us. But, um, but overall, I think that uh, this is a very good book, um, even if I have cool. like little quibbles about terminology ultimately it's a semantics game he sure. also acknowledges like this is my theory this is like my hypothesis i could be wrong sure i think he's fundamentally right i just wouldn't give it a new name i would just call it techno monopoly capitalism that's what it is <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um yeah. you know monopolies have always extracted rents whether it was standard yeah. oil standard oil or or it's amazon like it's, yeah. it doesn't matter um but i do think it's a very good book um he's very fun to read he's very charming um, and, uh, there are certain aspects I haven't really even gotten into, which is like the psychology of desire and talking about like oh, marketing geez. and all that, that he talks about in the book. Like that, there's a lot of that in there too. Um, I highly check, recommend people check it out. Um, it's very easy to read. Um, cool. and, and, uh, I enjoyed reading it a lot and I think it helps explain a lot of things that for me originally just didn't make a lot of sense, which is like initially like the whole like why 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 are profits prioritized in a lot of these silicon valley firms like why don't they talk about that right and now i know it's because they're much more interested in extracting rents because that's going to be their means of a profit rather than yeah. creating goods and services so yeah. um so yeah so that's techno feudalism definitely check it out and yeah. uh and yeah it's uh it will both inspire you and 
and infuriate you and <laughs> depress you all at the same time. Right. <laughs> all right. So I guess what are we covering next time? So next time we will be recording near the 4th of July, American Independence Day. So I always like to do in those early July episodes, I always like to do something American history themed. So for those of you who don't like that, I'm sorry, but I can't help myself. That's what I do. I love American history. That's my, that's my field. That's what I like to do. So next time, we're going to talk about arguably the most influential economic thinker in the history of the United States, and that's Alexander Hamilton. Ah. So next time, we're going to be talking about Michael, Michael Parenti's son. Christian Parenti, who is a great okay. author and journalist in his own right, wrote a book a few years ago called Radical Hamilton. And we are just started reading it. I okay. love it. He is saying things I've said about Hamilton for years. Because I just want to I want to put this out there for people. And I'll probably mention this in the main episode next time too. I was into Alexander Hamilton before it was cool. Like people, <laughs> you know, people know who Hamilton is now because like the musical and all that, but like right. the first paper that I ever wrote in college was about Alexander Hamilton. Ah, interesting. And and about a Hamilton economic policy. It's the okay. first essay I ever wrote. And I've written about him a lot. I wrote about him many, many years. And it's so amazing to read someone else who gets it. Ah. Why Alexander Hamilton is so important in the terms Ooh. of the history of the development of American capitalism and why this idea that um, the founding fathers were all a bunch of right libertarians is bullshit. Yeah. Because Hamilton was not. Right. He very much believed in state intervention in the economy, and okay. he built his he built the American government around that. So um, I think, as George Will once said, most Americans like to think they live in Jefferson's America, but in reality, they live in Hamilton's, and he's ah. right. But that's <laughs> what we're going to be talking about next time. We're going to be talking about Radical Hamilton by Christian Parenti. Very cool. And I guess all that's left is where can people find you? You can find me at justinclark.org. Um, one thing I've been doing recently is outside of the show, I also read a lot of other books um, outside of the show, and I do short book reviews on my Instagram, and I've been compiling a few of those into blog posts. So I've put out a nice. couple blog posts of the multiple book reviews. Um, the first one's called Science and Society, so it's books related to that. So I talk about um, uh, Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which is about television. I talk about uh, Richard Lewontin's book, um, uh, biology is ideology, which is a, I think an incredible book about the problems of biological determinism. Yeah. And then the second post that I released this week, um, is, uh, a overview of Rick Perlstein's history of the American right. So way, way back, this is probably two, three years ago. Now we did Nixon land on yep. the show. Um, well, I've read all the other books in the series. There's four and I've written about them. And that's also at the blog in the history of nice. the rise of the American right from Barry Goldwater to Ronald Reagan. So um, definitely check that out too. And then you can always follow me on social media. I'm at Justin Clark, PH. PH stands for public history. Cool. Um, and uh, I'm also on, I'm on Instagram. I'm on, I'm on uh, threads. I'm on TikTok. But I'm mostly active on Instagram. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's where people can find me. And as I always say at the end of the show, please consider becoming a patron of The Skeptical Leftists. Uh, patreon.com forward slash the skeptical leftist or skeptical leftist. Um, Corey does an incredible amount of hard work in the back end here that allows me to just, you know, be here goofing for an hour talking about crap and making my job very easy. Corey does a lot of really hard work behind the scenes to make this all happen. He does not just this show, but he has excellent interview shows. He's doing a wonderful show with his partner, Pam. Yeah. Um, and uh, so definitely, definitely go and check that out. Um, patreon.com uh, skeptical leftist uh, please consider becoming a patron um, you get all kinds of really fun stuff if you do that you get the pre-games the post-games of this show same yeah. with the other episodes I think yeah. Um, and uh, yeah so definitely become a patron right on well thank you very much Justin and thank you to everybody who watched and uh, we'll see you all next time thank you all right folks that's all for now thanks for watching or listening Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie Athope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron, 
and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a Substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I would like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post-show chat. I was reading, I was like, this kind of sucks. Like, I wouldn't yeah. want to live in this like weird, isolated little town. Everybody's like this like little small business owner and and they're exchanging yeah. gold. Like, well, no, this sounds terrible. Like, no, thank you. Like, not to mention the fact the other thing is too, is that she doesn't really think it out very much. So when you think about the gold, it's like, well, she doesn't really talk about okay, well, how are how are rates of exchange established? Like, yeah. you know, who sets that? Well, if no one sets that, then like no one sets that. So like somebody could scam somebody else. It's like, yeah. this is the thing is it's like, it just never made any sense to me. The problem with Ayn Rand was that she genuinely believed that the capitalists are deeply moral and that they right. care about others and that they're honest, which is the, really wild to me. None of that's true. <laughs> and so what I found fascinating was, she was so surprised that like people in the business community weren't coming out to like support her or whatever. And it's like, well, first off, a lot of business people in the 1950s and 60s, when she's like at the peak of her popularity and fame, a lot of them are liberals. A lot of them are people who vote for the Democrats. A lot of these people are people who their their industries like General Electric or yeah. other or, or 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 Boeing or whatever. They're tied to government contracts. Like there's a, you know, the state and capital are very intertwined. They always have been and they always will be unless the system is upended. Yeah. So she just never understood any of that. It was it's kind of a childlike way of thinking about the world. It's it's yeah. very, very odd. Liberty, right libertarians are a special kind of delusion.